Never forget, it's all about the lowest common denominator, which is the guy in the ditch. Your whole reason for living is that guy in the ditch who's bleeding out. The Chinook fleet had just gone to war, and I just couldn't wait to go and get amongst it. This is going to be interesting if we're fitting these weapons. Deployed when I was 21, I was the youngest aircrew to go to Iraq at the time. You know all the rules and you know how to bend them when someone's shooting at you. When you get shot at, it's like crossing the road and nearly being hit by a car. It's kind of over before you know what's even happening a lot of the time. That ramp that I stood by made a difference every day. On my busiest day on Mert, we had 14 shouts, 14 nine liners back to back. But it has taken a toll on you, hasn't it? There has been a downside to doing all that, hasn't it? So I got med discharge in 2019 from the job that I had wanted to do since I was 17. And then 2020 happened. And on the Friday, you're in the club. On the Monday, you're not in the club anymore. I was only going one way that day. There is a will inside us all to survive. Be careful what you wish for. This week's debrief then, I've got a very special young lady with me here. Ten tours of Afghan, two tours of Iraq. She's been there, seen it, done it, got the t-shirt, over earned it, I would say. It's Liz McConaughey. How are you? I'm all right, Phil. How are you? You're all right? You're good. I'm cool. I'm so glad we finally got you in here. I know. It's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. It's a long time coming. No, no, no. It's a, the pleasure is all ours. So look, what we're going to do today is we're just going to have a little chat. I want to find out loads and loads about you. We'll plug your book and all that sort of stuff. Yay. All right. <laughs> right. And we'll get the, we'll, we'll, we'll just get to the nuts and bolts of your story because it's an Sounds amazing good. story. Oh, thank you. Right. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk little Liz. Yeah. Yeah, in, back in the day, back 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 in when you was at school and all that sort of stuff. Good, good childhood. Happy yeah, childhood. no, I am um, obviously from Northern Ireland. If anyone hasn't yeah. figured that out by now, um, and yeah, I went to a grammar school, which was very much a case of. He was a clever kid. Well, I don't know about that. It was kind of the biggest <laughs> school in the area, and I was a bit of a country bumpkin as well. But um, you know, it was the kind of school where you had to go to university, you had to fill a yeah. new CAS form, you had to go off to uni, and quite early on, I realised that I didn't really want to do that. I didn't want to just go to uni and get a, a degree for the sake of it. So I started looking at other stuff in terms of career and my brother was mad keen in the army so he ended up going up to a place called palace barracks you might be familiar with no, it no, back palace. in northern ireland yeah, yeah, yeah. and he was going up to do his barb test to join the army yeah and i went with him as his little sister i thought i'll go and give him some moral support and when he went in to do his exam um there was a magazine on the table and i had a picture of a helicopter and a guy hanging out the side of the helicopter on what i thought was a piece of rope and I said to the guy in uniform, uh, what's this job? This job looks really cool, the guy in the rope. And he said, well, for starters, it's a wire. And the job title is helicopter crewman. And I remember thinking at the time, that's so cool. That is the job I want to yeah, do. Really? So I asked a few like uh, more questions about it, got accepted to do an interview, and then basically um, had to go over to England to do my aptitude test and whatnot. But I remember the whole time doing that, basically at school saying, well, that's me wrapped. I was doing A-levels at the time and kind of wrapped on them a bit because I thought, well, this don't is matter. what I want to do matter, instead. I'm yeah. doing that now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and many years later, I was lucky enough to take a Chinook into my old school to the rugby pitches mm. when I was over there doing some tasking. And I remember sitting there, you know, all the teachers had said, oh, you'll never make anything of your life if you don't go to university. And they're all suddenly wanting to look around my Chinook. And it was really good because it was a good advertisement for the kids there to say you don't actually have I, to have a degree. You know, that's a very good point you made there, right? Because I wasn't, I was quite clever, but academically, I just didn't want to know. Maths and English, yeah, when am I going to use that? Do you know what I yeah. mean? So, you know, other kids can look at what I've done, what you've done, and go, actually, I can have a really decent life, and if I don't get those A-levels, who cares? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, that's where, you know, if I'd have looked at that magazine at the time and gone, well, I've never been in a helicopter before, there's absolutely no way I could ever do that job, you know, that classic imposter syndrome, then I never would have, you know, even tried. But the point I think I like to try and tell kids now when I do talks is that, Anything is possible, you know, as long as you're a sponge. And that's the best, best thing about the forces is they take people in and they train them. You know, they don't expect me to be operating a Chinook in Afghanistan, firing a minigun on day one of being in the Air Force. You know, that's a long journey to get to that yeah. point. And I think for anyone looking at a forces career, you know, as long as you're a sponge and you're willing to work hard and take it all in, you'll always have a really it's good It's that old career. classic, isn't it? You'll get uh, what you put in. Yeah. And you quite literally will, won't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, tell us yeah, a bit about your training. Where, where, where do you, I, I know nothing about what you would have done. I really don't. So tell me about where, where did you do your basic training? What, what was it like day one, what butterflies, like? all that sort of stuff? Yeah, so I'd never really been to England until I came to, the, um, to do my aptitude test at Cromwell. And then past those who got accepted to come over and kind of do all the, um, the prerequisites for joining up. 
And then I came across finally on my 19th birthday to join, to, you know, attest to the Queen and serve Queen and Country for the rest of my life. You still and got a fiver. Did you get your fiver when you signed up? No, you I did not. No, you I got you nothing. Said, you take the Queen's shilling, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Back in your day, maybe. Not <laughs> in my day. I didn't think you got anything. What was funny, though, was in the joining instructions, it said um, you're going to need wooden, wooden coat hangers for basic training. For your, obviously, for your locker. And my mum, being an Irish mum, thought, well, you can't get them in England. You'll never be able to get them in England. So she packed me off to start my entire RAF career with a bag of 48 wooden coat hangers. <laughs> and like, not a lot else. So I basically joined up this little girl with a bag of coat hangers. Um, but yeah, and I think, you know, my main feeling really from day one was being a part of a team. You know, offloading yeah. your bags off the bottom of the bus yeah. outside, you know, the block at Cranwell. Um, you were part of something. That You're every- the same boat, aren't you? Yeah, and You're everybody wants one. you to succeed. There yeah. was only three females on my intake, so I was always in the minority. And as my career went on, I then became the only one for most of my career. But um, I was never single out what to be anything weaker. What sort of stuff did you do in your basic training? Because, I mean, as an infantry, I did the sort of like square bashing and then, you know, you, you start to learn a bit about weapons. How did your career progress? So the first couple of weeks is all Air force stuff about ranks and, you know, the, the command structure and things like that. Uh, a little bit about air power. Really big, big picture stuff, I guess. And even yeah. then, I joined the one service that every single rank is like a line on your shoulder. <laughs> yeah, so I was still like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> no idea about the senior ranks. I was still saluting the corporal in the main gate for most of my <laughs> most of my first year in the Air Force. But uh, yeah, so that's like the early bit. And then you go off to do a lot of like leadership training. Because I think yeah. with air crew, they are basically recruiting you in to be leaders. Because okay. you're, you know, you come out after three months of basic training as a sergeant which after three months in the RAF that's a huge rank to that hold on your shoulder that is a big rank isn't it I mean that's like yeah. that, you know to put that in perspective infantry are lucky to get that oh, after, that's years. after 8 to 10 years possibly absolutely you know, in my case hardly ever it wasn't coming do yeah. you know what I mean so, and uh, the reason why we come out as sergeants is so that we can command the rear of the aircraft because in theory we're then briefing all the rest of the, the British Army yeah. and we have to have a little bit of gravitas about that and, you know, demand a bit of respect I think when we're giving that safety brief so that's why we come out as sergeants. So it's mainly focused about those leadership tasks. So we do a little exercise up in um, Otterburn, um, about three quarters of the way through the, the course. And then you either pass or fail that, but you then go and do it again. So everyone gets a second chance okay. at those kind of exercises. And it's things like running around. Back in the day, you were running around with pine poles on your shoulders and you would then have to build like a tripod and signal for an aircraft that's coming in. Or you've got to build a bridge across this lava pit and all those kind of things. So... You know, usually they would take away the one piece of equipment that you'd really need yeah, to do the yeah, task. Yeah, 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 so you're yeah, going to yeah. fail, but and it's how no you rope. learn. <laughs> yeah, and it's how you basically lead your team, you know, how you delegate, how you prioritize, all those kind of things. So that was 12 weeks. And, um, you know, I could barely run a mile and a half when I joined the RAF. And by the end of it, I got a lot fitter, obviously. But it was it was that feeling of everybody wants you to succeed and kind of everyone pulls you through. And I was very, very young. So I was only 19 going through that. And I look back now and think, how the hell did I get through that? Yeah, 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 but yeah. maybe there's an element of naivety. I think if you join the forces young and you're still quite naive, it can play in your favor a bit because when you're ironing your bed space at four o'clock in the morning for an inspection, you just do it. It's like another hoop to jump through, isn't yeah. it? And you just want to get yeah. through. Whereas you, you're 23 years old. You're big on what am I doing this? Yeah. What am I doing this for? Yeah. So. So that's kind of the naivety I think got me through. And at the end of the three months there, um, you pass out into the sergeant's mess as a sergeant. And again, we were called, we were nicknamed plastic sergeants because yeah, we'd been in for five minutes and we're yeah. walking around with that on our shoulders. Um, so spent a little bit more time at Cranwell and just learning a little bit more stuff about how to be air crew. So a bit about navigation and radios, the ways of the air, that kind of thing. And then I get given a dream sheet. And on that, you can pick rotary or fixed wing. And I'd only ever wanted to go rotary because on the second time I'd ever been to Palace Barracks to do my interview, I um, parked my little car in the car park and jumped out to get a car pass and a chinook came waxing over the top of me at like 20 feet. And I remember it's looking at the... sound, isn't it? That oh, sound is so distinct. Gets you right in the chest. Yeah. And I remember looking at the belly of the aircraft and just going, that is what I want to fly on for the rest of my life. So I, I put rotary for my option there and was very lucky. Went off to RAF Shawbury, which is in Shropshire, beautiful part of England. And then spent six months there learning how to fly on a little Griffin helicopter, which is like a Huey yeah. from Vietnam. So really small, you know, you can't put anything inside apart from a couple of packs, a couple of people. Um, and it's only got one centre hook. So we kind of learn how. And the crewman's job is essentially the eyes and ears of the pilot. So you'll have a pilot that'll fly the aircraft. Yeah. Certainly on a Chinook, you get two pilots. 
And then down the back, the crewmen are the people who kind of voice marshal the yeah, aircraft you're around the sky. The on and all yeah, that sort of stuff yeah. And... You're basically telling him where his ass is because he can't see it. <laughs> so at Shawbury, it was all very basic stuff. You know, go and pick up really light Anderson loads and things like that, and making sure you were, you know, on top of the navigation and a bit of radio um, communication, but nothing really particularly exciting. And then at the end of that six months, you get given another dream sheet, and you get to pick which helicopter you want to go on, which is where it gets interesting. And back in the day, back in the day, I sound really old, um, <laughs> the RAF Air, Air, still operated Sea Kings. So we still had the search and rescue fleet. We had uh, Pumas, Chinooks, and the Merlins had just come into service. I was hoping you were going to say Wessexes and I wouldn't have felt oh, so Oh, no, old, Wessex <laughs> went out not long after. It was I've still, been older. <laughs> it was still in service then, but it was nobody was being posted there. It was kind of the, the dying breed, sadly. Oh, dear. Um, but I, again, I put Chinook for like basically option one, two, three, and four and got posted Merlins. And I was absolutely gutted on my roll disposal, which involves like a little assault course, lots of beer. And then you get told which aircraft you're going to. And I was posted Merlins. And then about 20 minutes after that, the course leader came over and said, actually, you're being re-rolled immediately because the Merlins were um, suffering loads of surface stability issues because they'd only just come into service. They were backlogged on all their courses. And the Chinook fleet had just gone to war. We'd just gone to Iraq. And they oh, were okay. crying out for air crews. So by the skin of my teeth, wow. I got re the Lady Luck on the shining down. Oh, there, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There was a lot more beer consumed so when, that when, <laughs> when was the first time you actually got on a Chinook and got wheels off? Yeah. So I was then, off I went to RAF Odium, which is still the home of the Chinook today. Yeah. And I was, I was 20 when I arrived. And I had my 21st birthday when I was on the Chinook school. So, yeah, 20 years old was my first trip in the Chinook. And you spend six months learning how to operate it. I mean, it's a base, as you know. It can carry 24 yeah. and a half tons of, of weight. Um, it can fit a Landover trailer, you know, 105 field gun inside. And it's got three hooks. So we everything that we'd learned at Shawbury on the baby helicopter, we now had to, like, up our game. Time's free, basically, isn't yeah. it? On, every, on everything, at least. Yeah, and again, our main bread and butter, really, as well as the voice marshalling the aircraft around the sky, is um, working out the payload. So everything you put inside, you need to make sure that it's going to be within centre of gravity, or it's not like you've put all the heavy loads at the yeah, front or the back. Yeah, if you mess that up, you, you could put everybody. Yeah, yeah, same as the fixed wing There's fleet. There's a lot, lot of responsibility there. I don't think, so. sometimes you look at the loads and you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Actually, the responsibility that you've got on your shoulders is a lot, isn't it? Yeah, and we always get, you know, confused with door gunners from the army. And, you know, I know a lot of door gunners as well, and they do a very similar job. But in terms of the responsibilities that we have down the back, and certainly... You know, in the early days, it's very much just uh, everything that comes over the ramp is our bread and butter. So it's like a bad game of Jenga most days trying to make yeah. that fit in. But then as kind of Afghans started to kind of build up, we were doing a lot more of the comms on the radio, um, especially on the TACnet. And we were doing a lot more of the nav as well because we got moving maps down the rear of the aircraft. So your responsibilities kind of grew as the years went on on the aircraft. You know, I think back in the older days, the old style crewmen, it was just humping and dumping stuff down the back. But then, you know, certainly the crewmen I know today that are still serving, you know, they pretty much run the entire shop floor. Wow. So, yeah, quite quite a lot to take on. So you, you finished your training there, obviously enjoyed it, loved it. Yeah. Did you go straight out on ops after that? Because obviously you were preparing for war because you've just been told everything's on a war footing and that's why I'm actually here. So did you yeah. go straight out? Well, I watched the Iraq invasion on a TV at Shawbury. So I was still at Shawbury at that point. And I remember we wheeled a massive TV into the centre of the crew room and watched the invasion of Baghdad. And just couldn't wait to get amongst it. And then, yeah, when I eventually got my first squadron, uh, which was 27 Squadron Odium, um, I was working up. So you basically arrive at a squadron and you're limited combat ready. So it's basically like having your L plates still on and you have to work up to be combat ready. And, and combat ready, I guess, is where you know all the rules and you know how to bend them when someone's shooting at you and you've got to take off before everything's secured. And you've yeah, got yeah, to, yeah. you know, you, but you know which rules you can bend safely. And that's essentially when you're combat ready and you're good to go. Um, so I was doing my combat ready workup and then I deployed to Iraq in 2003. So I was still limited combat ready. I was one of very few people that did that. Um, and it meant that actually my Iraq medal has got air crew cadet around the edge of it because I was still non-substantive sergeant. <laughs> wow. And, you know, there's only two people have got that, me and my mate Logie. But, um, you know, I, I remember before I even deployed, seeing all the guys and girls come back and get off the bus outside the squadron in their old desert combats. You remember the ones that were like pajamas? Yeah, they were yeah, really yeah. soft, yeah. really lovely. I, lo I miss those. <laughs> and you know, the guys and girls would jump off the bus outside the squadron. They'd be really tanned. They'd come up for a brew before they went on their leave. And they'd have all these war stories. And I just couldn't wait to go and get amongst it. 
So I d- yeah, deployed when I was 21. I was the youngest air crew to go to Iraq at the time. Um, but it was like a big adventure. You know, you joined to do a job, don't you? Yeah, of course you do. Couldn't yeah. wait to get out there. And so where, where were you based out of when you was over there? Out of Basra. Okay. Um, so, and the war fighting had finished. By the time I did get there, the, the main war fighting had been done and dusted. So a lot of the stuff we were doing was routine tasking, just moving troops and supplies mainly around the theatre. Um, there was a base nearby called Shiber, which oh, was no, nicknamed Shibetha. Shibetha, that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how the field hospital was. So we used to go in and out of there with the odd casualty because we were holding a thing called immediate response um, team at the time, which was essentially the airborne ambulance, which then became Mert in Helmand. But, um, I mean, and the stuff we were taking in was really quite benign stuff. It was mostly like appendicitis or someone had twisted a sock or something or yeah. twisted eyelash and off we'd take them in there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the sites we'd go into in Basra itself was the Shatel Arab Hotel, Basra yeah, Palace, yeah, yeah. Yeah. those kind of places, and the old bit of tasking out west. And then we held the main I- IRT, the main amb- uh, airborne ambulance, was held from Alamara, which is about halfway up between uh, Basra and Baghdad. Yeah, that was fairly punchy up that way, wasn't yeah, it? Was, yeah, yeah, and that's probably... Bandit uh, country up there, wasn't it? If you, yeah. if you got up there, it was, it was it'd be yeah. quite hard, wasn't it? Yeah, but the most of the time in Basra, you know, I have to say, it was, it was a good place to cut my teeth in terms of knowing, getting to learn my trade, knowing there was a bit of a threat. You know, it wasn't certainly wasn't Kansas. You know, there was a threat, there was an yeah, enemy. Yeah, 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 but yeah. in terms of what we were, you know, getting shot at routinely, it wasn't as bad as that. And it wasn't what then Afghan became, you know. So it was, as I call it, my normality bar. That's when my normality bar of like, ooh, there's a bit of danger here. It's a bit exciting. <laughs> That's when that started to build, really. Yeah. So I did two two debts in in, um, in Iraq. And um, yeah, it was, you know, the, I think the, the, the lasting memory I have really, I saw a Puma crash out there. There's a Puma crash on my... Second deployment down there. They used there. to do the air bridge, didn't they? The Pumas yeah. across the thing. I've been, I've got a picture of a, I've got some footage of a missile coming past one that I'm in, and the thing oh, going really? like that. I'm like, honestly, yeah. And all you could do is laugh because you're like that. Do you know what I mean? What, what? Yeah. It's going down or it's staying up. That's all you got in it. And I, you know, I talk about that a lot, and I do talks and stuff around the, the UK now. And, and that's the one thing I say a lot is that we squaddies and just people, you know, forces people in general are so good at normalising trauma and normalising danger because. Uh-uh. It's kind of our bread and butter, isn't it? And you end up just, you have that dark sense of humor for when you see something pretty traumatic and you've got this like just laughing sense of humor every yeah, time yeah, you yeah. have a near miss. <laughs> you're like, and the amount of times you compare, oh, if it had been a foot hot, tight and like taller or if it had been here and not there, or if it had been there five minutes earlier, we'd be dead now. And you can't do that because, you know, you just. You know. Yeah, yeah, you can't pick it to pieces. You no. just got to accept you're in the Glad to Be Alive club. Yeah, and take it for what it is, and never glad to be that. alive. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> and you know, I so many times people have I said, "Oh, you're so brave," and I think you know, you know, I don't ever feel brave. I feel like when you get shot at, it's like crossing the road and nearly being hit by a car. Yeah. It's kind of over before you know what's even happening a lot of the time. Yeah. So I've been quite lucky in my career. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have. So Afghanistan next. There was a bit of a bit bit punch in Afghanistan, wasn't it? Yeah, for a lot of for a lot of you did ten tours there. I mean. And there was such a difference in sort of like mission creep and all the stuff that was going on. I mean, you must have seen the lot out there. Yeah. So um, we went in 2005. We pulled straight out of Iraq and went straight to Helmand. And we didn't have any kind of regroup as a whole fleet. So the aircraft were already pretty tired by the time we got there. And I think we all were as air crew as well. Um, now, we do three. In the early days, we were doing two months at a time. And then that became three months at a time. So although I've done 10 tours, which is still a long time in Helmand, um, it's not like 10 tours of six months the way the, the guys in the ground do so massive respect to, to them for doing six months at a time because that is a graft but uh, yeah in the early days we were based out of Kandahar the big air base which is mainly I've run by there. the Americans I've been there yeah, yeah, yeah and it, I mean it's not like war there is it because there's no. a pizza hut there's burger king yeah. yeah, there was a, there was a pizza hut yeah there, <laughs> and where the, I mean the Yanks do war pretty well don't they yeah. so <laughs> again it was really kind of I still didn't really feel like war at that point and um, Bastion didn't really exist in my very, very first debt. It was just a desert bowl surrounded by a barbed wire fence. Yeah. So we ended up putting one aircraft down the, uh, uh, at Camp Bastion and just one crew on Mert standby for a week at a time because any time we've got British boots on the ground, you have to have this Mert, which was the airborne ambulance. Um, and that crew would hold that duty for like a week well, at a time. Well, you've got in the crew of a Mert, just to, just to emphasize to the people, you've got, you've got a doctor. Yeah, so you've got the four air crew, so two pilots, two crewmen, yep. and then you'll have um, four medics usually, which is a, a doctor, a nephetist, a combat medic, and a combat nurse, that kind of thing. Um, and then you've got the force protection guys, and there's usually six of them, and it'll be whichever battle group are in theater at the time, 
who are holding that duty. So it's been before Marines, Paras, okay. RAF Regiment. You so know, that's you what's going to secure the ground when the chopper comes down. Yeah. So we have you, What have you got on the guns? Have you got? We've got, um, and that's how I kind of knew Afghan was going to be a bit of a beast compared to Iraq. It was before we went to Helmand, we started to fit the mini guns to the aircraft. So that's what we've got, and that's what we always flew with in Helmand. A minigun on the front right right and left hand door. Yeah. And um and we had an M sixty on the ramp. And the minigun firepower in the early days it was two thousand rounds on one trigger, four thousand on another, it was higher rate and lower rate. And we used to joke it was for women and children and real badasses, but <laughs> obviously it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> obviously it wasn't. <laughs> and then we combined the trigger, so it's now got one trigger and that's three thousand rounds a minute, which is a lot of fire. It's a beast, power. isn't it? It's a beast. I remember getting yeah. out two a minigun in Sierra Leone when we when we did oh. our little job over there and yeah. it was just Insane the noise coming out the side of the helicopters, you know what I mean, for the period of time it gave us cover. It was just, yeah, it's the immense. noise is immense, and um, it's got we've got four bits, so four ball and tracer. And that means that if you fire that weapon at night time, it's like something out of Star it's Wars. Like, I always liken it to if you put a laser onto a, one of those glittery balls in a discotheque, yeah, and it just go, Bing! <laughs> absolutely, just, that's what it looks like, isn't yeah. It? So that's how we kind of knew that's how I, as a youngster at the time, thought, well, this is going to be interesting if we're fitting these weapons to the aircraft. Yeah. So yeah, that's what we always had fitted to all of the aircraft in Herrick, whether or not they were holding Mert. And then an M60 at the ramp, which is an old American gun, the same as what they use in the Vietnam War. And because yeah. the Chinook is an American aircraft, that's why we, I was get asked Was there a dedicated the gunner to that, or was it just anybody who could get to it? No, the other, cr- the other crewman. So okay. number one crewman was the crewman at the ramp, number two crewman was the crewman at the door. Okay. And we'd swap every day. You'd get a bit of go, a go on both. Um, and the only reason we had the, the M60 on the ramp and that's because it's got like a pit pin so you can release it take it off and yeah. that means you can put vehicles and stuff inside so yeah. it's a lot easier to have that fitted at the ramp than it is to have another minigun yeah plus um, the minigun's got a great big box of ammo and all that oh, yeah. sort of stuff yeah so and we used to carry two cans space, yeah so we used to carry two cans of ammo both sides so you'd have 6,000 rounds which um, yeah it's pretty of a beast Gives you about five seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's the irony is, yeah. It doesn't last that long when you're giving it some. Um, so, yeah, we held a very, in the early days, we held the one aircraft on March down at Camp Bastion. And basically our bread and butter tasking was in the, the first couple of deaths I did was building Camp Bastion. So every day we'd lift from Kandahar, we'd put the ramp down on the line at Kandahar, we'd fill up the aircraft with whatever would fit in. So, you know, cable drums, step ladders cement mixers, donkeys, whatever the hell had to go across the Red Desert yeah. to build Camp Bastion up out of the ground. Um, and it was mad watching that grow over the years because by the time we left Herrick 10 years later, it was the size of Reading, which is huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah, in yeah. the early days, it was literally like Star Wars country driving around. You had to have your dust goggles on while yeah. you're driving the Landovers because you couldn't see anything and shemags on. And, you know, it was, it was honestly like a scene out, scene out of Star Wars. Um but yeah, and then eventually um, the whole Chinook fleet moved from Kandahar across to Bastion and that's where we were built whenever, or that's where we were based whenever we had all the, the hardened runway and stuff put in. Um, and that kind of coincided with about the same time of just injecting so many more troops into Helmand because the early days we had Kajak at the top of um, the Helmand Valley where the Marines were mainly based. We had Sangin with a couple of powers in Sangin, um, Goresh, which became Fob Price, and Lash Kagar. So there was like four or five places well, to go They were all land. proper punchy places in the day yeah. as well, weren't they? Which yeah. Herrick was it? One of the Herricks was absolutely bonkers, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. So from about 2007 yeah. onwards, it got A-level. I mean, it got yeah. really kinetic really quickly. Um, you know, Sangin was a real hotbed. We'd get contacted. Near, well, the powers were pinned down in Sangin for about two weeks. And we had to drop a lot of ammunition and water into them under some loads and basically just hoped we didn't get RPG'd on the way out. Um, and the Kajaki has always been a bit of a hotbed up there. Yeah. You know, Kajaki Sofla is a real, you know, nasty, <laughs> nasty place to be. Yeah. Um, and actually Seven Squadron, which is the Special Forces Squadron at Odium, they lost the Chinook up at Kajaki. So, yeah, Kajaki was always another sort of tasty element. But then, from, yeah, from about 2007 onwards, you know, Musicala, we, we put troops into Musicala. We actually put troops in, brought them out, and then put more in again. Um, and all the fobs, the hoy up the Hellman Valley, started, like, to grow. So, you know, we had Inkerman and... All these different little places the hoy up the the um Helmand Valley. And it stands to reason that the more troops you have on the ground, the more IEDs are gonna get stood on, the more bullets yeah. are gonna fly, and it just got so kinetic from oh seven onwards really. So the Mert teams now, they, they must have been they must have been rotors running for the majority of the time that they was on the pan. Like they must have spent more time off the pan than they did on the pan. Yeah, and it got so originally we held the duty for a week at a time and then they decided that, that was too detrimental for people's mental health because of the stuff we were saying. So they put people on for a, a day. So we did a 24, 24 hour shift and then off. 
and because you were on response time 15 minutes during the day and 30 minutes at night time and that was you know that wasn't a target we didn't get a merch shot in and then just go oh we've got another 10 minutes before we need to get airborne we went as yeah, soon as absolutely that, that spot platform on went um, and you know like coming back to what you said my busiest day on merch we had 14 shouts 14 nine liners back to back and it was like scenes from MASH you know we were bringing casualties in taking them to Nightingale which was the helicopter landing site at Camp Bastion and another nine liner be coming through in the radio while we already had casualties on board. So it was like drop them off, back out again for more and, and just It's, it's the little things and stuff like that. That sort of like when you see a chopper in the back of it, you think, yeah, that's what but then you start thinking, hang on, there's puddles of blood in it now, isn't there? And all yeah. that sort of stuff. And that is sort of like it's it's different, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You don't I, expect I mean, to sit, you walk into helicopter, you're like, Oh yeah, yeah, all right, where do I sit? I mean all of a sudden it's like there's blood on the floor, there's there's bits that yeah. have probably been left off of bits. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a, My um the engineers, um our our Chinook engineers had to routinely wash out blood and bodily fluids from the the, the floor of the aircraft. So they ended up fitting a rubberized floor to the Mer aircraft after a couple of years because it was just gonna protect the floor and make that job slightly easier for yeah. them probably wasn't that easy to get their head around um but you're right i mean i think i got i got so desensitized to it that um my last merch shout on my last deployment i remember being picking up an american who'd been killed and we picked him up he was on a stretcher with the stars and stripes over him and i got handed his foot in a clear plastic bag at the time um it was you know i just set it down on the floor beside me because it was so normal at that point you know mm. and i'm not unique in that respect you asked most of the crewmen who served all those herricks we were just kind of immune to what was going on down the back after a while. I mean, I picked up five of the rifles guys who'd all been killed in one sitting and watching five stretchers come past you at the ramp, all with a different flag on them. You know, there's a rifles flag on one of the bodies, a Man United flag, Liverpool flag. And just to see those those bodies, just the number, you know, five of them just sat on our floor and their colleagues, you know, set the, the bodies down, touched the, the flags and then went straight back out into the fight. Yeah. And, you know, I've kind of got through most of my career on a bit of a wink and a smile at the ramp. You know, if there's 40 lots of Bergens that need to come over the ramp, you know, I help the lads, they help me. Yeah. But there's nothing you can do in that moment to smile. Like a smile and a wink is not going to change the, the, you know, how their day is going. And no, to you, watch still, them go you, back can, out. you can still do that shout, go back and be faced with another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was relentless. And I think, um, you know, we all started to really, like, normalise that trauma and... Uh, that and we never used to personalize the bodies you know the bodies were always just really precious pieces of freight that we had to get back to camp bastion um because the second we started to think about who was inside it would really like damage our mental health but obviously you would see sky news a couple of days later if they had died you would see you know the report in sky news and you'd see maybe a picture of them or whatever in their uniform and that was always quite hard to take and then the odd time you'd bring a casualty in on mert You'd go down, shut the aircraft down, go up to the, the um feed hall for, for um scran, and then you'd be walking out and you'd hear up minimize get called. And then you up minimize for anyone who's listening doesn't yeah, know yeah, it yeah, is. Yeah. They shut down all the internet and all the phones. That's right. So you so the, so the loved ones don't get to find out yeah. through Facebook and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember, you know, hearing up minimize echo around Camp Bastion just used to break my heart. And then the odd time it would be on for days on end and you thought, you know, their families still don't even know that they've been killed because it would get lifted as soon as the family had been contacted. Yeah. So whenever it was on for days on end, you just thought, um, you know, that poor family still have no well, idea. There's somebody on holiday now yeah. waiting for, for yeah. the most honking phone call they've ever had in their life. And also, you know, in the, the really kinetic time from 07 kind of through to maybe 10, uh, to 10 or 11, um, it'd be on for days on end just because there were so many casualties coming in who were dying. Yeah. And, you know, that was just, you know, part of the job. I remember in my latter years, and I think this is when you know you've probably it's time to leave because I remember a couple of young lads whinging about the internet being off or not minimised and whinging about a ramp ceremony because it was getting in the way of their gym time. And I went, got a bit, <laughs> I got medieval very quickly on them. I said it's an bent honour. Shape, proper yeah. bent out of shape. Yeah. You know, it should be an honour to go and stand at a ramp ceremony and pay your respects to someone who's not getting home in one piece. And um, yeah, I always thought that I held ramp ceremonies with the utmost respect. Yeah. And it was a three line whip, and even that used to annoy me. The fact that it was almost like you were told you had to go, you should want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, it should, yeah, yeah. If you it can, should you be, should be there. Yeah. Everybody should be there without fail. So, um, have you got have you got a particular shout or incident that sticks in your mind more than the others? Yeah, there's a few. I think you know certainly the picking up the five of the rifles guys that that just that image will always stay with me. Um, and one of the early shouts I did was a marine from Kajaki Dam who died, and he was Marine Curry. And just the name Curry was uh, across the the green tape on top of the body bag. And it, you know, many years later, I was in a 
a bar in Hereford on a Sunday morning having a coffee and reading the papers. And there was an article about this chap in the papers. And I remember just bursting into tears. Like, this is like eight years later. And my, my ex at the time said, you know, what was wrong? And I said, I'm just reading this story about this guy. I picked him up. And the name had just stuck with me because it was just such a distinctive name. Mm. Uh, and here I was reading about, you know, his family and his fiance. So that was that one was quite hard. And, you know, it wasn't always negative stories. We picked up so many guys who were dead when they came over the ramp and then came back to life at our feet. And that is a testament to like the medics that we flew with. They were flying angels. I mean, the, the medical advances that were made by those people, especially in sort of like trauma management and, and bleeds and all that sort of stuff, were phenomenal, weren't oh, they? Oh, yeah. And At you must point, have actually seen that progress in the time that you were out there. Even Yeah, even with the kit that we were carrying, you know, that grew. In the early days in the Mert, there was a little bit of med kit down the back. And then by the end of it, it was literally like an operating theatre, a flying operating theatre. And every single bit, piece of kit had a very distinct place it had to be. So whenever you swapped all that kit onto a different aircraft, Every single thing had to go back in exactly the same place. And that's so the medics could, they knew. That, that exactly technology has actually sort of like come home with you, if you were, because that's what they're using yeah. on the, in the ambulances and that now, you know, especially the, you know, I, I spoke to a medic the other day who said, in some respects, you know, ethically, you're thinking, should you be doing this? Should we be keeping yeah. them alive this long anymore? Do you know what I mean? But that's, yeah. that's the way it is, you know. Well, at one point in Helmand, it was the only place in the world you could survive a non survivable injury, which is a massive testament to those people, the yeah. fact that, the, you know, they can. They can do that. And actually, like you say, the lessons that came back at one, I think Britain still are the forefront leaders in terms of head injuries and blast injuries because of all that knowledge that came back. And years later, do you remember the Alton Towers disaster where the um, the kids were stuck? So one of the medics that was first on scene at Alton Towers that time had done Mert out in Herrick because a lot of the Mert medics were actually volunteers from the NHS. And he called across on the radio that day um, up vampire, up vampire. And that was a code word that we used in Herrick whenever we needed blood prepped at Camp Ass at the hospital. We would call up vampire over the radio and they would prep blood because obviously guys bleeding out down the back. So this medic on the day of, of Alton Towers called up vampire across the net and a couple of people in the hospital picked up on it and started to prep blood because they knew what that meant. And I just think all those lessons, you know, yes, it was a huge amount of loss that we, you know, from in terms of what we saw in, in Helmand, but those lessons will, you know, they they're still helping people today. But it, there's always a, there's always a positive to yeah. be had from from the, from, the, from there somewhere, isn't there? That's what, yeah. that's, that's what I'm getting out with it. Yeah, and we picked up. I mean, <laughs> picked up some funny ones as well. I had to pick up a Taliban once who had been involved with troops in contact with our British soldiers. It was paras, and we had like three or four paras come on on stretchers, and then the Taliban soldier who'd been shooting them, and that was really morally hard to get your head around because I was like, why are we picking him up? But at the time, yeah, because there must deemed... be an element inside just going. I'll tell you what: when we yeah. get about six thousand, drop to the centre <laughs> hatch. There's, there's, an, there's, an open, there's an open door down there, Sam. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> and I think you know, really hard to morally get your head around that. Um, picked up an Afghan soldier who wanted li- he was going to default from the Afghan army, so his bright idea was to shoot himself in the hand, but he couldn't steady his hand. He was shaking too much, so he decided to put his hand on his leg shot himself through his hand, through his leg, and it ricocheted into his other kneecap. So he picked him up and he had three bullet wounds and had one hand and both kneecaps. And you're like, well, that's that's the Darwin effect, isn't it? That's natural that, that is, That's an award. That's, yeah. not effect. that's an award. You've won the thing this yeah. year. And we picked up a little girl, one of the most the positive. I mean, we picked up so many Afghan locals who were caught in the crossfire. But I remember picking up a little girl and she'd swallowed a spring out of a mattress. And we picked her up and she couldn't speak and the spring was lodged in her throat. And she came on over the ramp and her eyes were like saucers coming over the ramp because obviously she was so scared, you know, she sees guns, she sees helicopters. And in Afghan, if you're a little little girl, little boy at that age, she was only about five, you know, that's destruction, that's death and destruction. And yeah, we were yeah, taking yeah. her away. Yeah. So she was absolutely petrified. And we got her back to Camp Bastion. They got rid of the spring and we went up to see her the next day and took loads of a Haribo and Coke and stuff up for her. And, you know, I look back now and I think about, you know, when we pulled out of Afghan in 2021, people always ask me, was it for nothing? And I'm like, well, no, if we give some Afghan girls their voice back to go to university, to grow, you know, to have an education, to leave the country. Yeah. And that little girl always just personifies that for me because we give her a voice back that day. You know, she was able to speak again because of what we as the British, you know, forces did for her. And I often wonder, you know, that was very early on in Herrick. And I wonder where she is now and if she's still got the voice yeah, and if she, she still did she make it out. 
I'm sure there's probably a Ross Kemp document doing there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but we did. I think we did make a difference and it'd be very easy to kind of wash it all away and say it was all for nothing. But I don't I, think I'd it never was. say it was all for nothing. I don't think never, it was. ever, because it's made a massive impact on so many people's lives that it would be absolutely unfair to say it was for nothing. Yeah. Right, the end result probably wasn't at what we all envisaged or wanted. But yeah. and to I say think... that no difference was made to some people, because it definitely was, 100%. Yeah, and I think every single person who was involved in Herrick I'm pretty on the ground, certainly. I reckon if you ask 90% of them, they'd say they'd go back again and do it all again tomorrow. I no, certainly would. And I'm you know, sure it's what would. made us feel alive, wasn't it? And yes, we lost so many on, along the way. But even those guys, I suspect, and from a lot of veterans I've spoken to, you know, they died doing what they loved. It was the one thing that really put blood in their veins and made them feel alive. So, um, you know, you've got to take some kind of warmth from that, I guess. Yeah, you know, most of those lads that joined up then joined up in the knowing that that's where they were going to go. They didn't exactly. join no boys club or no drinking club. It was like, yeah. no, 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 I'm going to war. Yeah. I'm definitely going to war. And I'm yeah. joining up to go to war. And it brings an interesting point. You know, I remember some of the junior crewmen who would come, because I obviously got kind of, as I went through my career, got up to the point where I was an instructor. And one of my last stop herricks, you know, some of the junior guys would come out and they couldn't wait to go on Mert and do that duty. And they couldn't wait to get shot at. And it's the kind of case of be careful what you wish for. It, some of you wants to tell them be careful what you wish for, but yeah. the other half you can understand because you were that, that was person. me. You know, exactly, I, that I went, was me. I went person. chasing it. I went chasing it. My son's in now. Yeah, he's like, well, something's got to happen soon. You know, yeah. It's like, and I look back at sort of when I joined. I joined a week after nine eleven happened. I remember watching that on the TV and thinking, that is the woman beside me. I worked in a little cafe at the time, and she elbowed me and said, "You're joining in a week, Liz. You're going to be busy." And never a truer word was said. And I look back at the slice of time that I had in my career. You know, I joined in 2001 and then, you know, had 17 and a half years from then. So because because of that time slice, I got my two Iraqs, I got my 10 Herricks. And after I left in 2019, I haven't done a lot since then. You know, Mali's been ongoing and they've done the odd kind of like new and relief thing. But in terms of actually going to war and doing what you joined to do, Nothing, nothing on the scale of no. those Herricks. Those Herricks were absolutely crazy, weren't they? Yeah. So I feel very privileged to be part of that. I certainly feel like, you know, being part of Mert was an honour. To be part of a soldier's last journey off the battlefield is something that, you know, I take a huge amount of comfort in the fact that I was there, that person, carrying them back. Um, And it's definitely shaped me as a person in terms of the way I look at things. I think until you've seen real loss, you don't understand what real love is. You know, I think when you see... It in people's eyes it's, when they're there's so many things it's a hardship as well you you, you yeah. see hardship on a different level oh yeah when you're in places like that you and suddenly I mean? like it, a bucket of hot water at the tip of your head I mean it's not it's certainly what I've seen in terms of austerity in, in Herrick was nothing compared to the guys in the fobs you know yeah. yes we had the feeder every night and we had pretty much fresh food every night Um, and we had showers ship's routine but it was still a shower you know, I've spoken to so many of the lads who were like, yeah, you'd be lucky if you get a shower once a week and it's yeah. a hot bottle, yeah, you know, it. it's hot water tipped over your head or whatever. They, they didn't moan about it, did they? they no. They, you know, they weren't moaning, you weren't moaning about it. Yeah, I know, I've had more austere conditions in Salisbury playing, which has been pretty crap <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some crap 12 by 12 exercises in Salisbury playing. But, um, yeah, you know, uh, you're right, it's a massive level of being in the forces, isn't it? Because you appreciate the really simple things. Yeah, and I think, look, Normal things. I don't get excited about normal things. You know what I mean? It's, you know, yeah. oh, you've missed the bin, man. You've missed the bin, man. Oh, yeah. I missed the bin, man. Yeah. I'll get him next week. He'll come next week. You know what I mean? yeah. So what? Who cares? And like simple things. Like <laughs> in the early days, I used to love getting blueies. Do you remember blueies? Yeah, yeah. But do you remember be, yeah. when people yeah. wrote them? And then it became e-bluey and I've everyone was just emailing John them. I've been before. I'm oh. <laughs> but, you know, I used to love getting blueies from home. And I used to love when they were handwritten. You know, but I always used to end up you know, tr- trying to open them up. And you always end up, you used to rip the first yeah, or the and last and line. it's always <laughs> the most important bit as well. Yeah. You know? we used the to first have, or last line. There's nothing worse than not getting one when everyone else has got one as well. We used to have a start made. You used to go, champion. Give that to Jones. Oh, <laughs> God. What an off. What an off. But that's, you know, coming back to what are the Chinooks did out there, you know, I was, that ramp that I stood by made a difference every day. And whether or not it was rescuing and saving lives or taking fresh boxes of oranges into the guys who'd been on rat packs for six months or delivering a letter from Granny, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, that yeah. ramp and us putting that ramp and seeing the guys come to the ramp every day made a difference it, it can make a yeah. huge difference morale wise you know what I mean you're, you're saying you know, like Danny's, Danny's bluey do you know yeah. what I mean like, wow and some cares. of the guys said you know even just going out the front gate of a fob and going on patrol knowing that we were there ready to come and get them 
But yeah, you know the, the security you get from that sound as well. That mm, sound you know again. when you're on the ground and you're like, wow, is that? Is that? Is it, it's coming. It's here. It's coming. You know? yeah. And it, and the instant it gives you that, wow, it's coming. Like, yeah. You know and then I mean? we blew the shit out of you as we come yeah. out. Bergens go <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Port Elise well, go land everywhere. About, you land about a thousand meters that way. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, in. but you know it's coming, don't you? Don't yeah. you? And that security of knowing it's coming or having it in the area is just it's it's incredible. Yeah. And for me, it was. I mean, one of my instructors very early on in my career. That Liz, never forget, it's all about the lowest common denominator, which is the guy in the ditch. Your whole reason for living is that guy in the ditch who's bleeding out. And that, that stayed with me for my entire career. You know, it was always about the guys. And we used to routinely max out the rear of the aircraft because we declared 24 seats on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. for tasking. But, you know, if it was an R&R &R run and we had to get guys out for R&R, &R, if they missed the air bridge from Bastion, that's like a five-day Rolex for them. Yeah. Five days out of their R&R, &R, which yeah. is only three weeks. So, you know, we would max out the aircraft all the time to get them back to Camp Bastion um, or just pull them out of the fobs a, a, a couple of hours early so they'd get back and get a hot shower at Bastion or get back in time for Scran. And, um, you know, the pilots up the front, I mean, they were we were all in the same boat, like ball game, we were all in the same song sheet, but we would, like, put the the dust curtain across so they couldn't see what was going on down the back and they'd ask, how many POB? 24. <laughs> uh, and they'd go to pull in power and they'd be like, are you sure there's any 20? Yeah, they've got really 20, loads 24 of kit. Biggins. Yeah, loads of kit, loads 24 of 24 big fills down the back. Yeah, and you'd just be <laughs> maxing the guys out, you know, as long as it was safe and they weren't sat right on the edge of the ramp because obviously you don't want to lose someone over the edge of the ramp. But, um, yeah, we um, we flew the Gurkhas for a lot of deliberate ops and we would just put ropes across the roof. And they would just stand up and hold on to the ropes. And we'd sometimes yeah. deliver like 40 Gurkhas in a one hour. So they're, they're tiny though. Just, and I remember a heavy landing when a couple of Gurkhas ended up in the cockpit because <laughs> literally the aircraft landed on and they just got airborne and straight into the cockpit. But um, yeah, as long as it was safe, we'd just get the job done. That's what the Chinook Look, Force you did. You talk day. about this job with so much pride and passion. I can tell it's all over you. But it has taken a toll on you, hasn't it? There has been a downside to doing all that, hasn't there? Yeah, so there let's really talk, has. So let's talk a little bit about mental health. I don't want to sort of like, We'll go as far as you want to. Oh it? yeah, happy but to talk about it all. Let, this is my bread and butter now. <laughs> let's talk about let's let's talk about the mental health aspect. When did you first realise that there was going to be a few problems? So I left when I got back from my last herrick, uh My neck started to play up, and um, you know, it's like the first day you take off leave, you always get sick, don't you? My yeah. neck had probably been playing up for months, but years. But I'd kind of just brassed it out because it was a job to be done, and it started to play up on back in the UK. So I eventually, after a mate. He called behind me as we were walking in from an aircraft and I kind of turned my whole body to answer him and he was like, Liz, just go to the fucking physio. <laughs> so I eventually <laughs> sucked it up, went to the dock, uh, got grounded straight away and I ended up getting grounded. I went to Aldershot, did a couple of rehab courses at Aldershot. That didn't really work. And then they sent me to Headley Court, which was the centre of excellence, obviously, at the time for all our, you know, wounded soldiers. And by the time I got there in 2018, it was empty. And I said to one of the guys in the course, like, this place is like a you know, deserted. And he said at one point there was a waiting list. And that really hit me hard because I was like, God, all the people we brought back have all been bottlenecked here. But that couldn't fix me either. So I got med discharge in 2019 from the job that I had wanted to do since I was 17. You know, it's just a straight, yeah. don't pass, go. Yeah. I got offered a, a desk life. job, but, you know, I didn't ever join the Air Force to do a desk job. My med cat, my med chit said I could only sit at a desk for 20 minutes. I couldn't do guard duty. I couldn't do any shooting, any prone position. I couldn't wear a helmet. I couldn't deploy in the UK or abroad. Couldn't do the fitness test, which at this point was my favourite bit. Yeah. And I, I remember one of the lads going, Liz, you've got the Carlsberg of med chits there. Just take the money and you put it up at work. Where's the fab log? Yeah, but I was like, do you know what? I couldn't look myself in the mirror every morning and go, I'm really proud of what I do if all I was doing was sitting behind a computer. In, yeah, in, so you think about what you did and when you did it. Yeah. I didn't want to be that girl who was wearing her blues and I'd never worn blues in my entire RAF career and managed to get away with it. No, I didn't want well to be that old. Well yeah. say, well, number two is for me. If I could swerve that, you know, I'll yeah. swerve at all costs. Definitely don't look good in that skirt and those tights. But um, yeah, so I, I decided to take the med discharge over the, the, um, the desk job. And then, so I left in 2019 and I remember at the time um, cracking a bottle of champagne on my last day at home with my ex who's worked at Hereford. And he was getting out at the same time. And we were like posted at each other and went, how do we get out alive? You know, we've got all of our limbs attached and our brains are still in one piece. And I'd seen so many colleagues fall along the way yeah. with PTSD. And yet here I was with 10 herricks under my belt going, I'm all right here. Got away with it. And I thought I had. So 2019 rolled on. I actually ended up going through a, a pretty messy divorce in the end with the ex. And it was that classic. Both had been in the military for so long. 
suddenly we didn't have a common enemy to fight so it was just much easier to fight each other yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. things started to unravel you know i think when you're both trying to figure out who you are as a person when you've taken that uniform off it was you know our house turned into a battleground um so we went through a divorce and then 2020 um got locked down and at that point i still thought i was okay you know i'd kind of been living my best life for 2019 i've been keeping really busy I've been going to the opening of an envelope as long as a free glass of Prosecco, <laughs> you know, I was, but what I now know in, in hindsight, looking back was they were all coping mechanisms, you know, yeah, keeping told, busy, told, yeah, yeah, running yeah. my body into the ground in terms of training, going to the gym, like five hours a day, just keeping busy. So I didn't have to sit at home with my own thoughts. And then 2020 happened, uh, March, uh, we got locked down and suddenly I had nothing but me and my own thoughts at home. And in the early lockdown, you only allowed out for like 10 minutes exercise a day. So from someone who'd been running marathons and doing Ironman triathlons and things, it wasn't even worth putting my trainers on for that. So I just stopped training completely. And when you go from one extreme to the other, I was just, you know, totally lacking in routine and purpose. And that's what we as veterans thrive on, isn't it? You know, we spend your whole life in the forces, like basically living on a routine. Yeah. And, you know, we'll always fit our little gym into our d- daily work, don't we? And suddenly that was all gone. And, you know, I'd gone from a job that had so much purpose to like, I can still be in my pajamas at three o'clock watching Netflix because no one gives a shit if I'm up or not. No one cares. And, you know, suddenly little Liz from Basingstoke wasn't making a difference to anyone's day anymore. So I started to unravel as 2020 went on. um, And I replaced the exercise with sugar. I got really addicted to sugar and sugar addiction is like cocaine. It's, you know, at one point I was literally eating spoonfuls of honey in the kitchen to try and lift my mood out of the gutter because it was in such a dark, dark place. And the thing, the endorphins that I usually would have got from exercise were just not there. So I was trying to eat, eat sort of my way to feeling better. And that just led into a really vicious circle of not wanting to train then because I felt even worse from all the sugar in my body. And then that developed insomnia. And as 2020 went on, my insomnia got worse and worse. And you and I both know sleep deprivation is a form of torture, isn't it? In the yeah, military, yeah, you know, I've, yeah, yeah, I've done my interrogation course and it is not good to have no sleep for five days. And the, the high, I think the, the moment where the red flags were really starting to show where it was one night I was awake at four o'clock in the morning and I got my logbooks out and started to look up a lot of the soldiers I'd picked up on Mert who hadn't made it home. And coming back to what I said earlier, you know, we never did that when we were on that duty because yeah. we knew it was going to be, you know, bad, bad duty. Kind of yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And yet here I was looking them all up at four in the morning. On and, your own. Yeah. On my own in my house. And I could, you know, I knew that I was in a really bad place at that point. And um, I could have picked up the phone to any single person. I could have called any of my RAF colleagues who had known since day one in the Air Force because they were all still like family. But I never wanted to be a burden to anyone, especially during lockdown when everyone was going through something. And I think being a female doing my job, even though the lads never, ever singled me out to be anything like the weaker sex or, you know, if I'd have been the girl crying around the back of the tent at the end of a merch shout, they would never have felt or made me feel like I was weak for doing that. In fact, very often some of the lads would be around the back of the merch tent having a cry and I'd go around and take them for a coffee, put my arm around them, do whatever. But I didn't want to be that girl crying. And that was an internal pressure that I put on me. You put your own pressure on. You Absolutely. You sort of like shackled it, yourself there, yeah. haven't you? And it came from inside, that pressure. And this, you know, whenever I was sat there looking up these guys, you know, I, I didn't want to reach out and ask for help. So it kind of kept snowballing to the point where in August we had a heat wave and I hadn't slept for days at this point. So I ended up taking a drug called amitriptyline, which I'd been prescribed for my neck many years before while I was still serving. And amitriptyline is a really good nerve blocker. A lot of amputees are on it. A lot of just the British public are on this drug. Um, it's a really good nerve blocker and it's an excellent sleeping tablet. You know, it knocks you out. So I ended up taking that on the Sunday night to try and get some sleep of this uh, during this heat wave. Took another one on the Monday. I woke up and I thought, well, that worked because I got a really good night's sleep. So I ended up reordering this amitriptyline online on repeat prescription. Took another one on the Monday, another one on the Tuesday. And I woke up on the Wednesday morning that week and I honestly felt it, it was like I'd been body snatched by the Grim Reaper. I woke up that morning and went, I'm going to kill myself tonight. Today's my last day on earth. Really? Just, it just flipped over? You're like, just like yeah. that. I was in the departure lounge. Did you understand why? Did you, did you, in your own mind, did you understand why? Or was it? No, it know? was just, yeah, I was so removed from my normal self because I'm quite gregarious and quite chatty normally. Yeah. And I was just, no, this is it. Today's the day. So I, I was really scared. So I ended up phoning 
the well the first thing i did was i emailed my doctor because it's so much easier to put things in writing than actually make that phone call isn't it so i emailed my doctor and i got an email straight away back from the pharmacy which is actually attached to the the doctor's building and the pharmacy said you know the email had been this is me i've woken up this morning i'm feeling suicidal i'm quite scared and i think i need some help and they emailed back and said you've come through to the pharmacy you need to contact your doctor (laughs) i was like okay thanks so i then phoned the doc I uh, got a lovely lady on the phone, lovely old lady. And I said, this is me. I've woke up this morning. I'm having suicidal thoughts. I'm quite scared. And she said, could you call back tomorrow? So that was a sign of the times for COVID, wasn't it? So um, I ended up breaking down on the phone to her. And she said, look, oh, okay, we'll get the doctor to call you this afternoon. So he called uh, me about two o'clock. And it was just a locum doctor. And at this point, you know, my feelings had been building all morning. And I was really quite distraught at this point. So I, you know, as soon as he phoned, I was just in pieces down the phone saying I wanted to kill myself. And he said, look, um, I'm going to prescribe you some antidepressants to come and get this afternoon, a drug called sertraline. Take it straight away, but you'll feel worse before you feel better. So that was it. And at no point did he say, um, do you want to come in and speak to someone? He didn't say, what other medication are you taking? Which would have been a really important question to ask. And he also didn't look at my notes to see that I'd reordered amitriptyline on the Monday. So I remember hanging up the phone that day from him and thinking, well, that's it. No one cares. You must, yeah, you must have thought yeah. exactly that. Yeah. yeah wow, you know, I've thanks. asked the professionals for Cheers help for and even they don't care. So, and that was the moment where in throughout that whole day, I almost felt really relieved. I felt like a big yeah, weight had been lifted. the doctor's made your mind up for yeah. you, hasn't he? She's like, I'll tell you what. I was like, I'm done it now. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. me. You know, I've literally, I've tried what I was supposed to do, which was ask for help. They don't care. And it was almost like I've been given the green light to go ahead with my plan. And I planned it in meticulous fashion. You know, that's the scary thing. I look back now and I've been on suicide websites throughout the day. I've been figuring out exactly how many of these drugs I needed to take to completely end my life. And then I went across at the pharmacy at four o'clock the afternoon, picked up my sertraline with one bag, one white bag of sertraline, another bag of amitriptyline that I'd reordered from the pharmacy that I'd emailed that morning to say I want to kill myself. And I still remember having to pay £13 on contactless to essentially go home and end my life. So I took the drugs home. I wrote a suicide note to my parents. Not even an emotion, you know, no tears, just as it is. There's my note. I tied in my apartment, did my hair and makeup, and at midnight took 95 amitriptyline and don't remember a single thing after really? that. Yeah. Wow. So, um, why did you do your hair and makeup? I have no idea. <laughs> it's just, and in fact, no, I, I did the is, whole day. I tidied the apartment. I suppose it's part of it. You put yourself into your own sort of like death routine, as it were. Yeah. You know what I mean, just to get yourself over the lump proper. It was honestly like that whole day was like watching my life through a movie. It didn't feel like me. And, you know, I've always, up until that point, I've always thought anyone who um, t- commits suicide, it's a very selfish thing to do. You know, that leaves a wake of questions behind them. And it's a, a coward's way out was my perception of suicide mm. before this day. And yet here I was completely emotionally checked out of life in the departure lines. And it's almost like, you know, at a water park, it was like picking up my donut and going down the water slide. I was only going one way that day. There's no way I could get back up again. I kind of joke with a few people now, like even if Daniel Craig had come around for dinner that night, I was still going through with yeah, my that's plan. It. Cheers, Daniel. See you yeah, later. <laughs> I was on a mission. And um, and yeah, I think, you know, the scary thing is that, you know, there are so many people who get to that same point and at that point is almost too late. So you need to get to people before they get into that departure lounge moment. Um, so, yeah. There's no ceremony. And the, and, the, and the very fact that you carried it through and took 95 says to me that it wasn't it wasn't a cry for help. There was actually a, a thing that was, oh, I'm doing it. No, no I it, was absolutely. And the only, yeah. so obviously spoiler is the fact that I'm here talking to you today. So I managed to come through it. Um, and... I woke up two days later in um, in Business Oak Hospital and I remember waking up and opening my eyes and there was a, a clock at the end of the bed and it said half six. And I thought it was half six the next morning and it wasn't. It was actually half six two days later. Two days later. And I'd been on life support for two days. Um, so I still who, who didn't... Who found you now? Well, I didn't know. And I had this tube down my throat. I, had the, I was incubated and I remember, first of all, thinking I was drowning. I couldn't breathe and I kept trying to pull this tube out of my throat. So they put me back under again, put me back to sleep. And then brought me around a second time and explained that I was alive and had survived. I was okay. And they were going to take the tube out. So they took that tube out. And honestly, that was probably the worst experience of my entire life, having that thing removed. Um, and they said that I'd been brought in by ambulance, but I didn't know how. And um, I thought, you know, had I made a phone call or had a neighbor find me or had a friend find me? I had no idea. And then eventually, two days after that, I got released from hospital and got reunited with my phone, which was left back in my apartment. And... 
I went through the call log and it turns out I called Samaritans for 13 seconds and then straight away after that I called 911. I don't really know why not 999, but the important thing is that number gets you through to the right people and an, um, that's, it was me that had made the phone call. I don't remember it, but I guess it proves that there is a will inside us all to survive, you know, yeah, that there subconsciously. Been, there must have been something there. There must have been something going, you ain't done yet. No. You ain't done yet, girl. Exactly. And I, after I sort of started to process it all, I phoned the, or got in contact with the ambulance crew who had picked me up to thank them. Because again, coming back to that, you know, we were in COVID times. They were really stretched and coming back to this suicide thing, you know, I'd always thought it's a really selfish thing to do because it just adds more pressure onto other people. So I called them to thank them. And it turns out I was extremely lucky to be alive. If I'd have um, washed it down with any alcohol, I probably wouldn't be sat talking to you today. And I lived pretty much opposite the hospital. I lived next to the hospital HLS. And I don't think if I lived there, I probably wouldn't have made it either. So Really? It was a proper... Yeah, it was very, very close. Yeah, yeah there, were, there was easy... When my best mate came around to my apartment looking for me the next day, obviously I was still in hospital at this point, Um. When she managed to break into the apartment, there was just ECG strips all over the floor and I'd been worked on in the living room. So I only kind of now I'm getting my head around how close I was. But I still look back and think maybe there's a reason. You know, I lost a really, really good friend who was another crew girl called Anna Irwin. She was, there was only ever six of us in the heyday. So we were all really close, close mates. And, uh, you know, her and I deployed to Helmand numbers of times and she won a Millie Award for bravery. She's a great girl. And then she lost her life to cancer. Uh, in 2018 but I reckon you know that night I bounced up to heaven and she went nah I'm having too much fun over here you get yourself (laughs) right down there and I do I think I've got a guardian angel because you know looking back at the statistics I probably shouldn't be here talking to you today but maybe that's you know I think also everything happens for a reason and maybe that's put me on the track that I'm meant to be on today which is talking about mental health and sharing my story and helping others I I think it's massively massively important people talk. I I still get the feeling it's taboo in many areas I still get the feeling it's not talked about enough and I still get the feeling that young people nowadays think that if they talk about it they're going to lose their stature or position within wherever they are do you know what I mean and I'm I'm desperate for people to talk about it really yeah is, is where I'm from yeah and the more I'm sharing my story and certainly since the book came out you know I get messages I'd say at least 10 a day from people who either heard a radio thing, seen a podcast or read the book and they share their trauma with me or they open up and finally say, I'm going to go and get help Liz. And yeah. they can identify points in my story where, you know, certainly that unraveling in 2020, that complete change of behavior because I had 180 from what I normally did. And I think that's where the forces are. That's their strength really is that, you know, we could come back from a herrick debt and you'd know the guy who was always first down the pub in Basingstoke suddenly yeah. wasn't going to the pub anymore or vice versa. Someone who was a real gym bunny, didn't really drink, was suddenly like, what time is the village open up? What time are we going you know, yeah, yeah, drinking? Yeah, 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 yeah. And we can spot those behaviours really quickly in people when you're all still together. And I think that's where I kind of slipped through the net because I was in lockdown. Nobody was able to see how much I was unravelling yeah, and that I'd shifted. Picked, people would have picked up on it had Absolutely. you been sort of like doing your normal daily stuff. Yeah, so certainly people that are hearing my story now, they're identifying that behaviour in themselves or in their mates, which is equally just as important. And, you know, I talk about that year, I was on this like river of depression. You know, I had good days and bad days, but I didn't know how close the waterfall was. And I literally went over the edge in 12 hours. So if anyone's got any mates who they think is floating around in that river, you know, get a hold of them before they go over the edge because once they're in that moment, it's too hard to get them back up again. Yeah, of course it is. So So, I really recommend people, if you've got anyone who's struggling at all, you know, ask them twice how they are because people are very good at going, yeah, I'm living the dream. How are you? And you never open up. It's easy. It's it's a throwaway thing. And especially if you say, like, when when you recognise now that you got to that point where you thought, well, nothing's going to stop this now, it's done. Yeah. Then, of course, you'd say, yeah, I'm right, yeah. I, I, I had a friend of mine who committed suicide in Northern Ireland and he gave me a compass was a little button compass and yeah. his old man had been a Royal Marine oh, wow. and he said I won't ever need this bill and he gave it to me just, uh, just as a sort of like throwaway thing yeah. and I thought oh well he's just cleared his stuff out two days later he shot himself in the face oh. and it was like that was the that was the sign that yeah. was the thing yeah. do you know what I mean that was there was yeah. no mess in there there was no there was no big performance in the naffy there was no big drinking and selling everybody it was like there you go Phil see you later yeah. and it was like we never picked up on it and I just think if more people had talked about it then perhaps we would have spotted the signs that were there really early on yeah and it is you know I think loads of people ask me all the time you know um, or loads of people share that they've lost someone to suicide and that they feel like they should have said something different or they could have done more uh, but you know I look at my day and my story and suddenly 
the hardest the hardest phone call I've ever had to have was my mum called the hospital whenever I was still in the hospital and three times I had to tell the doctor I wasn't ready to speak to her because I mean what do you say to your mum after you've tried to kill yourself and then my little brother who'd been living with me for a couple of weeks during lockdown and he'd only just moved out or like let because he was just basically keeping in my spare room he only had left the week before and he arrived at the hospital and was like just in pieces he was like you know why didn't you say something what could I have done and watching his face so broken you know in that respect it just it certainly hit me you know the ripple effect of of that of what my actions had been but the truth is that anyone who always asks themselves that like I'm sure you feel like that as well I think whenever someone's made their mind up they've made their mind up and it's really hard yeah I mean unfortunately it's something I've come across since a young years ago in the army yeah my first friend did it years and years ago um and every time it, there's been a, a finite thing where they knew they were doing it. Yeah. And you never. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I've come across loads of others who've sort of like been found, but the ones who didn't want to be found have been like, they've just gone and done it. Yeah. And, and like, it is wow. the quiet ones. You know, there yeah. is, there is certainly that. And the same as like you said, you, you, you researched how many tablets you were going to take. In your own mind, you'd already done it. You said goodbye to everybody. The doctor rubber stamped it for you and yeah. off you trotted like you were yeah. gone. And I think there is a huge, di- you know, there is certainly those people out there who, will make a cry for help um only recently i had a chap who messaged me actually on linkedin a guy i didn't know um complete random stranger is a veteran um and he just messaged me one day on linkedin about three weeks ago and said liz i'm gonna kill myself tonight now i, I have no training of how to deal with no. that uh, but i seemingly over this last 12 months have kind of become this either ambassador or beacon whatever way you want to put it of like people the veterans mental health he reached out to me so he wouldn't tell me how or what he was planning to do and I was sort of like in a disarray of I say I didn't know anything about this chap so I ended up looking up on LinkedIn where his company was based managed to call his company still no answer there but they were further up north than where I live so I eventually managed to get out of him why he was planning to do it and he'd booked a hotel and he was on his way to the hotel so managed to get hold of the police and give them all that information and then called the local hotel Oh, the local police station to the hotel. Um, and it was a veteran guy who was actually answered the phone who's a copper. And he was brilliant. He said, we'll get there. We'll get hands on him. And I called the hotel as well to warn them. And it was the most, but the funniest conversation of the hotel when everyone speaks European and actually you're trying to tell them, no, it's not my booking, but there's a man on his way to your hotel <laughs> and he's planning to kill himself there tonight. So that was a very odd conversation to have. But the good news was they did get hold of him and they got, you know, they phoned me back 20 minutes later to tell me that they got him. And he was okay. And I remember the overwhelming relief of that, of just going, I don't even know this guy, but just feeling like, you know, they've got him and he's okay. But the fact he actually put it out as a very much, I think, a cry for help, you know, and I think he just wanted to speak to someone. He just wanted to be heard and someone to put their arms around him. Um, And the sad fact is that a lot of the time for veterans, that that falls to the veterans' charities, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and, And unfortunately, a lot of people will not, reach out at all because they're just too scared to because it's just yeah. or they think oh, they'll just think I'm bluffing yeah you know up courage I mean? is be... good because up courage I only realised this recently Um, they do serving people as well as, as veterans and I thought it was purely a veteran service because mostly combat stress and help for heroes yeah. are all the veterans whereas up courage which is quite a new thing really it's only been going about a year maybe 18 months they do people that are still in service and, and I think that's it's a good it's a step in the right direction I mean yeah. You know, when I was in, you had the WRBS woman. If you went around there for anything more than a cup of tea, people were like, what are you doing, Phil? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and you know, Hereford in itself, you know, because I would say my, my ex was from there and we, we were together for about 13 years. So I kind of know how bad Hereford do it, you know, and I always used to suggest, why don't they just all come back from up and they all have 10 minutes thought with a doctor. You all have to go into that room for 10 minutes. What you say in there is confidential yeah. and you all have to come out. And if you sit there in silence for 10 minutes, you sit there in silence for 10 minutes. But if you spill your heart out and ask, say, I need help, then you do that. So no one outside knows what's going on in that door, but everybody is mandatory. You have yeah, to no, go in that for 10 minutes. It's a very valid point. And I think, you it know, takes the stigma away, doesn't it? Hopefully the, you know, the powers that be will start to, looking at stuff like that. I've always said that there should be like a probation system for when you get out. There should be a handrail put in place for five or 10 years. Yeah. If you did 25 years in Nick, You'd get probation for the next eight, wouldn't you? Do you yeah. know what I mean? Without a doubt. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And you'd have something to fall back on. I'm not saying you have to use it, but there should be something there if you need it. Yeah, it's such a hard stop at the end yeah. of the military because in the old days, they used to cut your idea up in front of you. Now I think they cut the corners off. But imagine you've given your life to something. You know, I only served 17 and a half. 
you know, I don't know how long you did them, but imagine if you've done 35, 40 years in, yeah. that, in that uniform. Someone chops your ID up in front of you. And on the Friday, you're in the club. On the Monday, you're not in the club anymore. And if you want to speak to any of your mates who are still in the club, you have to pull in. You've got to get a car pass. You've got to get escorted onto camp. Yeah, you, you are can't just go and have it. Yeah. You are completely out of the loop, yeah. aren't you? It yeah, is yeah, so yeah, badly yeah, yeah. done. Yeah. And I think there are so much better ways of doing it in terms of, you know, maybe the first month you're out, you're allowed to go, to go back for a coffee invite to your old squadron, your old section, yeah. whatever. Uh, or you're invited back for a couple of mess functions. And there should be, the, that pastoral care should be, you know, for the first month you're out, you're invited at least once. Then maybe another two months later, you're invited back again. And I'm not saying forever, but at least for six months after yeah. someone leaves, that you should get the chance to ha- be able to go back into Yeah, there should be some of sort of handrail that if you're really struggling as well, you can go, yeah. right, I'll tell you what, can I just come in and sort this out? Do you know what I mean? Maybe have yeah. access to the medical facilities or whatever. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah like you say, the chopping up of the ID card. I mean, that's brutal. That's brutal, isn't it? It's yeah. is proper brutal, isn't it? And I only recently, I've started doing some talks for the Met Police, actually, which obviously they're going through the mill at the minute anyway. Yeah. But I was sort of recalling this to some of them and the police have none of that. You know, the police, you could serve your entire life in the police and the day you hand your uniform in, that's you done. They don't do, you know, at least with the forces, we do have resettlement. Yeah. They teach you how to write a CV, even though my first CV looked like Lizzie, age five and a half had written. <laughs> but they do have those things in, in place to kind of shimmy you into Civvy Street. And the police don't. And I think that leads to a lot of police probably staying in those roles for longer than they should be, yeah. even when their mental health is failing. Because there isn't an easier way to get out and into right. a civvy job. Uh, it's, 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 so they're kind of just hamstrung and they're there because it's they don't know anything else and there's not a an easy facilitated route out into Civvy Street. So, Liz, going forwards and from here on, well, what are you doing? What are you up to? So obviously when I was going through PTSD counselling, wrote the book. And, and again, that wrote... Plug um, the book. What's it, the book called? It's called Chinook Crew Tick. Which is a bit of a mouthful. Chinook crew tick. I can't say um, it. I'm not going to try it. Chinook no. crew tick. Oh, I've done it. <laughs> well, they originally, the publishers wanted to call it Chinook girl. And I was like, I've never been called Chinook girl in my entire life. But the lads used to call me chick. Used to get called Doris quite a bit. But um, <laughs> Doris. Which is a sign of affection. So I never had an issue with that. Um, but yeah, so I wrote that in three weeks during my PTSD counselling. Because I find writing's quite cathartic. I used to write a lot of poetry. And... It's a good way to get stuff off your chest as well, isn't it? Because you're yeah. actually going, right, I'll tell you what, there it is. Bang. Yeah, exactly. There it is. And, the book was never written for anyone to read. The book yeah. was written like a verbal diary. I just get out on the laptop. And then it was just kept in a file on my laptop. And it was only about a month or so later, I was walking with a friend and I told her, I said, don't laugh, but I think I've written a book. She was like, well, send me it over and let me have a read. So I did. She's a civvy. She read it. She said, this is really good. You should send it to some publishers. So I did. And off it went. And then Penn and Sword published it. And it came out in September. And I did sold out overnight. It literally sold out overnight and went to bestseller on Amazon in the military section. I was like, wow. Not none of which I'd ever expected, so that's kind of catapulted me into the speaking circuit now. So I do a lot of talks, you know, for a lot of big corporate companies, people who, not a single person in the room has got any military experience, which I love because at least I can kind of highlight not just what the Chinook Force did in Helmand, because I'm extremely proud of that, but also those things that all of us veterans suffer whenever we do come out. You know, when we take the uniform off and the music stops, you know, yeah. the things that we suffer. And, and there's no chair to sit on. No, exactly. <laughs> there's, all, there's already a civvy on it. Yeah. And, <laughs> do you know, I think, um, you know, veterans, because I was a veteran at 37 and combat stress are really good at the minute. They're trying to rebrand what a veteran is because I think everyone's got that image of like the older guys stood at the side of the cenotaph. Yeah, which, with rightly his blazer so. on and his tie yeah. and his, but, you it's know, a bit tired. It looks a bit tired. It's not, yeah. it's not in keeping with how we are now. No, and, think. you know, some veterans could be in their early 20s, you know, maybe for Helmand. I think most of them are probably pushing towards 30 now if they've yeah. done, done time at Helmand. But they're still young lads and they will never tell you what they did. They'll never, if they go into a civvy job, they'll just, you know, hide in the background and get on with their, their life. And I think that's where trying to highlight what a veteran is, they hide amongst you. You know, they are the best asset your company will ever have, but they'll have their worst CV on the table. And it's getting civvies to kind of understand that. So I love doing corporate gigs and I've done a lot of stuff for the Met recently. I did a talk a couple of weeks ago for the UK Search and Rescue Force and the, in, just in terms of what they've done over their careers, you know, they're scooping up dead bodies out of the water and off cliffs and stuff all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's not, not a pleasant not a no. pleasant thing. And they the do stuff. the same as what we did in Mert. Yeah. They normalise that trauma. Um, and they've also got the darkest sense of humour to deal with as well, which again is fine until the jokes stop and then what do you do? So... Um, getting out and doing all these talks and then I've just been signed off by Penance Order to another book so there is another book in the making wow what's it going to be can you tell me can you give us a little yeah, bit of a, yeah, an yeah. insight into well, it I've got a few. I'd like to write a sequel to my actual book because so much stuff has happened since Chinook Crew Chick came out you know it's been an amazing year and it continues to 
be I used to continue to pinch myself every day. You know, I never thought a, a year ago I'd be sat here talking to you. <laughs> so I would eventually like to write a sequel to the Chinook Crew Chick. But the next book coming out is actually, there's 17 chapters in my first book, Chinook Crew Chick. And I served on 18 Squadron for pretty much most of my career uh, and certainly all of my Hellman deployments. So the next book is going to be chapter 18, Their Stories. And I think that um, everyone's got a book in them. It's just having the time Mate, to write I'll it. Say that, I'll say anyone who served, especially in those periods, yeah. has probably got two books in them. Like, yeah. you know, easily. You know, yeah. It'd be two good books. Not exactly. two sort of like mundane, shitty books. They'd be good books. They'd be good ones. So I think, you know, it's, it's time to be able to give a voice to a chapter to er like various different people from the squadrons. You know, going back to the engineers, you know, they would wash out the aircraft after a merch out, you know. And it, even just seeing that side of the trauma where they haven't seen what's going on in the back they just see the after effect and they're kind of dislocated from it. That will affect them. You know, the senior engineer, I guess what kept him awake at night was, is the engine going to get in in time to get the Mert aircraft serviceable? You know, our squadron boss, I'm quite sure, you know, who'd gone from a junior pilot right up to the squadron boss, his now main area of concern was, I'm going to take 60 people out and bring 60 people home or I'm going to lose an aircraft. So every single person involved in that you know, even down to the armors, who usually would be the first people on board the aircraft after we'd had a massive contact and be brass everywhere. And they just look at you and go, you all right? And just that saying, you know, just those people, they've all been involved in Herrick and we all saw it through very different eyes. Mm. So the next book's going to be 18, 18 stories from 18 wow, people. Wow, so dedicated to... Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a very valid thing to do. You know, when you think about, you know, whatever force you are, you might be the tip of the sword. You might be the one at the sharp end. But to get you there... Yeah, there's always a whole, whole bunch team of people. of people doing all sorts of cool, interesting, and, and and dangerous potentially stuff. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah no, no, no. And I think the the Chinook Force deserved to have it catalogued what they did in Herrick. You know, we were the workhorse of Helmand to coin a, a, another title of a, a mate's book. He's just it released it, but you know, we were battlefield helicopter that were the, the heartbeat of that whole campaign. So I think it's. That, I mean that that time. helicopter is so iconic from. More than just one generation. I mean, you think back to Northern Ireland, you think about the Falkland Islands, you think about that helicopter has been responsible for saving one hell of a lot of people, hasn't it? Yeah, and Bravo November, which is the most famous Chinook, it's recently been retired up to the RAF Museum in the Midlands. But Bravo November was the only Chinook that made it back from the Falkland Islands. So there were six aircraft, I think, went south. And it was the only one got off the Atlantic conveyor. And then it, it yeah, essentially... some of them ended up in the sea, didn't they? Yeah, some the rest of them went in the, the organ. Yeah, they? yeah. <laughs> so they went in the drink. And um, and Bravo November survived. And then it ended up, at one point, it nearly flew into the water on a, an exfil, I think a night exfil or infill for some troops. And they actually jettisoned one of the doors of the aircraft. So they flew the whole of the Falklands campaign with the pilot's door missing. They lost, they, well, they lost with, with, with my old squadron on the Falkland Islands. It was before I was in this foot. But they actually yeah. lost one as well, didn't they? Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. Bravo November made it back, and then it's continued to go on through. Uh, it went through the Gulf War. It did um, all like all of Herricks, and the amount of I'd love to do some research and find out how many lives that that aircraft has saved. I, I don't think you could find it. I don't yeah. think you could put, put pen to paper because you think of the civvies, you yeah. think of the, of, of the serving members, you think of all sorts of stuff it's done. You know, yeah. not to mention the drops it's done into places where they've been down to sort of like down to the down to their pen night fighting, yeah. and all of a sudden oh, there you go. Have, have that, some more ammo. If that aircraft could talk, you know, the stories it would tell. Yeah. But um, I then, after being up to see it a couple of, uh, last year when it was just, um, it was like an unveiling day, um, I, I went home that night and dug my logbooks out again. And it turned out, and this is almost sweet poetry you couldn't write, is that my very first ever Chinook flight, Chinook Famil 06 at Odium was on Bravo November. Wow. And my very, very last ever flight was down the Falklands on Bravo November in January 2018. So she, that aircraft book ended my career and, you know, and she's the most famous Chinook. And every time I've been up to see her a few well, times. That, that might be your book title. Yeah. Well, I'd love to write, I'd love to write a kid's <laughs> book about that. But um, yeah, so, so there's a couple more books in the pipeline. Um, That's kind of, and I'm hoping that Tom Cruise might make a movie about it or something, but. You so, get a cameo role in that, Jordan. Yeah. yeah. I'd have to be in it. I mean, one of the door gunners. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> You're the only one qualified for well, that Well, someone said, oh, we should call it Top Gunner. And I was like, no, that's far too cheesy. But you know, it would be, it'd be a cross between Private Benjamin and Black Hawk Down because honestly, when I was joined, I was so naive. And then, you know, 19 years old, really didn't know anything about the military to going to, you know, flying and operating a massive 24 and a half ton helicopter with a minigun in Iraq or in Afghanistan six years later. You know, 
That in itself, I think, is pretty. You met the king, didn't you? You met you met you met the king, and <laughs> yeah, you, gave, you, gave, you gave him a bit of a one liner as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> go on. He came he came to Odium years ago and did our op Peric ceremony for our yeah. medals for op Peric, and it was hilarious because they were all put on Velcro so that he could just tap them on your chest. Yeah. And he came up past me and he said, um, "So have you ever been shot at, my dear?" And I said, "Yes, your royal highness." And he said, "And what did you do?" And I said, "I shot back, your royal highness." And he went, <laughs> "Very good." <laughs> and just kind of carried Mate, on. That's an alley answer. Yeah. He'd, he'd have appreciated that. But he pressed my medal on so lightly because obviously back in the, I mean, go on, he didn't do a Russell Brand on there. He just tapped it on really lightly, and off he went down the line. <laughs> and as we were marching <laughs> off the parade square, it fell off. So I had to go and retrieve my medal back off the parade square at the end. All but scratched um, up in there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he's a nice chap, you know. I think. Um, We've flown some, you know, we've flown loads of um, politicians over the years and, you know, the CSE showgirls and that kind of thing. And that's, a, you know, I have, a lot of those people love to jump in a bandwagon, don't they, and come out to Herrick and get their, you know, yeah, but, but they do lift morale. There's no two ways about it. So, yeah. yeah. Listen, you've been a phenomenal guest. I hope that you'll come on again as these books start rolling out and as your name gets bigger. Yeah. Maybe well, the paperback's you're... out in October and then there's the um, the audiobook's coming out soon as well. Have you? Have, did you narrate the audiobook? I did. So yeah, you would be safer I'm buying the book because you you're going to need uh, subtitles to read it. <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well just buy the book. <laughs> yeah, so it comes out later on this year. So it would be lovely to come back again. Brilliant. Yeah, well, we'd love to have you. You're phenomenal. I'm a massive fan now. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much, Phil, for having me. Cheers.